Okay. Today is October 2nd, 2015, and my name is Tony Hilliard. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center, and with me is Peggy Hilliard, another volunteer, and Sue Verhoff, the senior archivist here at the, at the center. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. Kenneth Matson, who served in the U.S. Marine Corps during World War II. Mr. Matson's oral history is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. With us also today are Mr. Steve Merritt, uh, who is uh, Mr. Matson's son-in-law, and Jenna Merritt, who is his daughter. We're honored to have you with us today, Mr. Matson, and thank you for participating in the project. Would you begin by telling us your full name and where you live? Yes, uh, my name is Kenneth S. Matson, M-A-T-S-O-N, and uh, my residence here is uh, at a uh, senior care center here in Conyers, and I'm happily located there. My uh, room, when I checked in there, uh, they had two rooms in the entire place. There are three buildings with 82 rooms or something. And so there was one room right in this, the, the one I chose, was uh, right outside my door. I could just step out and there was my table in the dining room. Okay. <laughs> and so I took that one. The other one was out in the left field. Okay. And uh, so I got the best room I could possibly get when I got there. And then the people are great there, and they have lots of things to do, all sorts of activities all the time and like that. And uh, so I became a great proponent of participation. Okay, good. And I would, uh, when we'd have meetings and so on, and they'd ask people if they had anything they had to say, I'd always get up and I think a lot of them would say, oh no, we're gonna get that participation <laughs> speech again, you know. But I would tell the people, you know, if you sit back there in your room alone, 24 hours a day practically, except for meals, what fun are you going to have? Exactly. Unless that's what you enjoy. And so get out here, participate. If there's something going on out here in the, in the recreation room, go down there. If you've never done it before, you may find there's something you like. And they play bingo over there, Get over there and play bingo, you know. So you're the motivator? For yeah. The, for the and so uh, that's I'm after them all the time to keep moving and like that. Good. And uh, But I get a lot of opportunities, too. I try every day to help somebody. And uh, sometimes I'll get a lot of opportunities. Sometimes I don't get but maybe one. But if I'm walking down the hall and there's some really elderly lady in a wheelchair trying to pump along with that thing. Mm. I walk up behind her and I always say, would you like a push? Because I don't want to walk up and do that and the woman's doing this for her exercise and she'll right. say, get lost. <laughs> so you get a bad reputation. Yeah, so I will always walk up and I'll say, would you like a push? And 99% of the time they said, I'd love it. So I take them up and they'll say, I'm in room 23. So I'll go up and take them in and park them in front of their TV and say, anything else? And they'll say, could you open the blinds? So I'll go over and open the blinds on the door and the window of the back wall. And what else do you need? That's it. Well, can you tell me a little bit, well, when were you born? And tell us a little bit about the okay. your early Okay, I was life. born in, on September 21st, 1923. So I'm 41 now. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe at actual last count I was 91. Okay. I just had a birthday. And uh, I was born in a little town of Elk Point, South Dakota, which is 15 or 18 miles from Sioux City, Iowa, way down on that southeast corner of South Dakota, 60 miles south of Sioux Falls. And I went to gr grammar school and high school there. And I had an interesting, my uh, uh, cards, that were, they reported your grades on them okay. so you could take them home and show uh, your family cards. how you're doing, and the report cards. Uh, my mother and father were always shocked at the cards because I had straight A's for the 
all the courses. Conduct, you. Unsatisfactory. Once in a while I'd get up to a D or something like that. But I had more fun in school and class than anybody else and just enjoyed it. But I was a smart kid. Okay. And I had a very high IQ and so on. When I took IQ tests to get into the military, uh, 124 is the high scores you could get, and I, my score was 122. And I never did find out what I missed, which question I missed. But uh, I uh, got into the service. Well, how did you get into the service? So my uh, mother had always espoused this theory to me when I was in grammar school. She said, when you are going through school now, take every math and every science and every English grammar and like that course you can get your hands on. Because when you get to college, you're going to have to write essays and you're going to have to get them typed. And if you have to pay for that service, it's going to be expensive. Right. But if you can do it yourself, fine. So I did. I, and in high school, or grammar school and high school, I really could type and I could really take shorthand. So my service record book in the service, and I was t tested on this, showed I could take shorthand 150 words a minute and type 100 words a minute. And that's pretty good for the average. And that was before electric typewriters were born. So uh, that was in my service record. And so I finished boot camp, and they sent me out to a, what was a little base then. Now it's one of the largest marine bases on the West Coast. It's called Miramar. And I went out there to be processed for transfer overseas. But it was going to be 20 days before the draft left to go overseas. So uh, it was the rainy season. And the base, the asphalt streets were in it like that but there were no sidewalks. So between the barracks building and the street was just solid mud during the rainy season. And so it made it a problem to try to, you know, shine your shoes and get all set to go in town on Liberty and have to go out there and wade through mud this deep. So and you were in the Marine Corps? I was in the Marine Corps, yeah. So where did you do recruit training? At San Diego. San Diego. You had a choice of San Diego or Paris. You didn't have a choice, I mean, but if you were, east of the Mississippi, Paris Island, west, San Diego. So I went through San Diego. And Dom, you were in the CCC first. Yeah. Did you ever hear of that? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a uh, uh, program that FDR came up with, I guess. Uh, so many of the men in the country were unemployed during that period. So they brought these CCC camps out. And they trained people there to do things like mow lawns, uh, trim trees, and things like that. And so they could, if a mayor of a town requested their services, they would send crews into town and go all over town fixing the trees and, and whatever they needed. And uh, they did a lot of great service like that. Was that in California where you did that? Uh, the South Dakota. South Dakota, okay. So it just so happened the wealthiest family in my little town of Elk Point was a family named Ringsrud. And uh, they owned a lot of stores and things like that, and they're a very wealthy family. And their son was Ron Ringsrud. And besides all of managing all these stores and like that. He was a captain in the Army Reserve. Okay. And by virtue of being that, he was the commanding officer of three CCC camps okay. in the state of South Dakota. So he came to my house one night. I had graduated from high school. My dad was a carpenter and he could build anything and like that. And, and at that time, he was building grain bins for the lumber yard in town, a small town. And the problem we had, the boys, all the boys when they were growing up worked with my dad, like at night, in the afternoons, uh, after school, 
and on weekends doing carpenter work. So by the time I graduated from high school, I was a pretty good carpenter. And uh, yeah, so... When you're talking about boys, how many brothers and sisters did you have? Well, there were originally 14 children. Wow. I was number 14. One had died at birth. And so I, I really had three, uh, 13 of us that survived. And uh, so uh, it was a pretty large family. And you learned to fend for yourself. You couldn't sit there and say to somebody, pass the biscuits or something like that. I was going to say, did you get enough to eat? <laughs> <laughs> and we had a lot of jokes and things about that status and so on. And the people across the street had how many kids? Nineteen. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't imagine, you know, you can't imagine somebody with thirteen, but imagine somebody with nineteen. And so they, uh, they really got along well. The father worked for the county on the road crews and like that. And uh, the boys in the family had uh, all, most of them worked as grocery clerks in the grocery stores after school and at night and like that. So they had a pretty good life. But I always got a kick out of it because quite often the mother would call and invite over to have dinner with him. <laughs> you go in and there's 19 people there. <laughs> and they, but they'd find a space for you there to make a 20th, you know. And uh, so it was, it was interesting to see it happen that way. And Ken, now you joined the military because you saw what movie? Uh, the uh, movie, this was in September of 1942. The movie was Tell It to the Marines. And that is forever since the Marines started. If somebody was telling you a story and you didn't believe it, you'd say, tell it to the Marines, see. So the movie starred a, a guy named John Payne. Yeah. Not John Wayne, but John Payne. And he was a big husky guy like that. He was a Marine. And of course, in the movie, he won the war himself and like that. So my buddy from high school and I went to see that movie. And this would have been in September of 42. Okay. And so we went to see that movie. And boy, we were hepped up on that thing. And so we both said, let's join the Marines. Let's go home and talk to our folks tonight. And if they agree to let us join the Marines, we'll go. What you had to do if you lived in South Dakota, there weren't any recruiting stations there. You had to go to Sioux City and they would check you to be sure you were alive there. And then they would send you, if you were, they'd send you to Des Moines, Iowa. And then you got the complete treatment, the complete physical and all that okay. stuff. And if you passed, they would swear you into the Marines right then. And then you would travel in civilian clothes, but you'd travel by train to San Diego for boot camp. Let me ask you a question. Where were you when uh, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Okay. Do you remember that incident? I was in that CCC camp. Okay. And uh, so uh, the, uh, as I told you, the commanding officer of the CCC camp was from my hometown there, see. So he had put me in there and, and a couple of weeks later I was in charge of the camp. And so when the war started, Everybody wanted to go fight those Japanese, you know. And so uh, I had uh, two brothers that were stationed at Fort Meade, South Dakota. And that Fort Meade, South Dakota was about two miles from the CCC camp. So I was pretty fortunate there in that I had family that close to the camp. And uh, so they wanted me to come over and join up in the Army and like that. And I didn't want to be in the Army. I didn't like the Army. I didn't like, they had no discipline and their uniforms were lousy and like that. So I didn't want to be in the Army. I didn't know what I wanted to be in, but I didn't want to be in the Army. And so uh, 
we, I wound up going back home from the CCC camp, and that's when my buddy and I went to see this movie, Tell It to the Marines. So we talked to our mothers and fathers, and they said, yeah, go ahead and join. So we went to Des Moines, and went to Sioux City and then to Des Moines, and uh, there you had to take your physical and like that. And assuming you passed the physical, then they would swear you in. But you could, it was a joint recruiting place for the Navy or the Marine Corps. But the two of us were going to be those big fighting Marines, see. So we went for the physicals. And it didn't take long to get the physical and like that. And I got the physical, passed the physical, okay. And so the doctor said, have a seat out there and pretty soon they'll call you. So I was expecting any minute that my buddy would come out and sit with me and we'd go join the Marines. And so I sat there for 20 minutes and 30 minutes and a half hour and, and pretty soon it was an hour and he hadn't shown up yet. So I finally asked one of the people that worked there where is this feller Clemenson that came with me? And she said, oh, he talked to the Navy recruiter and he found out if he joined the Navy, they wouldn't be shooting at him. So he joined the Navy. <laughs> and there you were. So he showed up in a little while and he said, I hope you're not mad at me. And I said, hey man, it's your life. You have to do what you want to do, you know. So I went on then and went to boot camp in San Diego. And uh, boot camp was tough in those days. I don't know whether it still is now, but in those days it was three months long. The requirements were tough. And you had to be able to swim forever. And just all sorts of requirements were put on you. And so uh, I graduated from boot camp and was going to get my first liberty. Because when you were in boot camp, you didn't get liberty. And so I got myself all snazzed up in my uniform and was walking towards the gate. And the commanding officer of the boot camp was a Marine colonel. And he had a wife with him. I didn't know it at the time, but this guy was a hopeless alcoholic. So. I started walking towards the gate, and I had about a block to go to the gate, and then I was going to just step out there, and probably the next car that came through would pick me up and take me into town. And uh, so this car came up there and screeched the brakes and stopped, and I walked up, and I knew it was a commanding officer's car, so I walked up there and big salute for him, you know, like that, and when I was six feet away, I could smell the liquor. And he was dead drunk. And I thought to myself, why, did, why would the wife let him do that? Or, or at least why wouldn't she be smart enough to stay home and let him go out there and get killed? And uh, so he said, come on, jump in. I'll give you a ride in town, you know. And I said, oh, just happened to think of something. I'm sorry, Colonel, but I've got to go back to the barracks. <laughs> and I turned around and started walking this way, and he drove off. And, uh, but anyway, I finished boot camp there and uh, uh, went out to Miramar then eventually for assignment. So what was your MOS? What was your duty? What it was, uh, uh, if you understand MOSs, I was an 01. Okay. 01, when I was enlisted, I was 0141. I was a, first as a clerk typist. Right. And then when I became an officer, it switched to 0130 which was administrative officer or adjutant and like that. And then I developed a couple of secondary MOSs that the general assigned to me. And, uh, but I was primarily in uh, administration like that. But uh, I got to do a lot of things that probably nobody in the Marine Corps had ever done. And uh, so when I, uh, my first real major assignment was I was transferred to Headquarters Marine Corps and assigned to the Inspector General's Department. And of course the Inspector General has the responsibility for inspecting the Marine Corps. 
and he had uh hey dallas can we come back to that in a minute because yeah. you're when you were in boot camp that was long before you joined the inspector general's office you were in boot camp and then you, how did you get with general moore oh okay well i uh had done my taken my mother's advice and got all the shorthand and typing I could and like that. But when I was transferred out to Miramar out there for assignment, I was waiting to go overseas. And uh, just sitting in the barracks while it was raining, you couldn't go anywhere. There was no sidewalks out there, so you'd have to walk in mud to get out to the street. So you were just almost in confinement. Right. And so I was sitting there, and the first sergeant came in, said, come on up front, the captain wants to see you. So my first thought was, what did I do? <laughs> and so I went up front with him, and this captain introduced himself, and he was a uh, Chicago attorney, a real shyster attorney. But the Marine Corps had taken him in uh, to be a legal officer, and they made him a captain to start with. So he was a legal officer for the base. So. He told me, come up to my office, I want to make a deal with you. So we went up there, took me in his office, and he said, I've got your service record here, Buck, and I see in there that you can take shorthand and type like a monster. And I said, yes. He says, is that true? And I scolded him. It's the first time I ever sassed an officer. What would that be in my record book if it wasn't true? And so. He said, well, I want to make a deal with you. Three months from now, I'm going to be in the South Pacific, and I'm going to be aide to the commanding general of all the Marines in the Pacific. I talked to him on the phone about you last night, because he said he needs somebody to work for him. He doesn't want a secretary. He doesn't want to dictate into a machine or dictate to a, a, a woman or a man with a, a skill of shorthand or anything like that. He wants to be able to call somebody in and say, I want to write a letter to the Commandant of the Marine Corps and I want to say this, 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 and this. And the next time I see that, it'll be a letter perfectly typed, no misspelled words. All I have to do is sign it and you mail it. Can you handle that? And I said, yes. And he said, you got the job. I went to work for him, and I worked for him for six years until he retired. Flew on his airplane with him. Anywhere he went, he took me, and we went to all over the world, Australia three times. And Is this the general? That's the general, James T. Moore. What did the T stand for? Tillinghast. Can you turn that around and just kind of hold it about just under your chin? Yeah. Hey, Da, look right here. Hold it like this, Ken. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yep, there we go. Yeah, okay. Did you like him? Whew, I loved him. He was like my dad. And I think to me, I was his son. He and his wife were married for 43 years and were never blessed with a child. So, I think that was a circumstance. Uh, he walked with the cane. He had a football injury when he was in the Naval Academy. At Citadel. Uh, or, I'm sorry, I always say Naval Academy. Citadel. And a uh, wonderful man, great general, great leader. And uh, much of the stuff that I acquired in the Marine Corps, the good things that happened to me, happened when I worked for him. So when, when did you get hooked up with him? Um, what year was it when you, you went out to the Yeah, well, I went in Southwest in 42, Pacific. and it was probably 1944, I would think, okay. that I hooked up with him. Okay. And uh, so then I was with him until he retired six years later. And uh, then he passed me to another general. And then when he would get transferred. If he was going somewhere I wanted to go or didn't mind going, they would take me with him. But if I didn't want to go, I'd tell him I really would prefer to stay here. And, uh, but if I, uh, 
I hooked up early on. Most of the people probably had put in 20 years, never realized that they could go to Washington to the Marine Corps headquarters, go back to the records department and look at their record. Mm -hmm. And you know, your service record book that you had with you in the service going from base to base might be about this thick. But your service record book in Washington would probably be this thick because everything that had ever happened to you anywhere, wherever, uh, would be in your record book. Hold that one up. Now you served with General Moore all during Hawaii, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. And that was at, that picture was at his command in Hawaii. That's good. Mm -hmm. So you went from Pendleton to Hawaii? Yes. Okay. And then mm -hmm. did you, where did you go from there? Well, uh, I would serve with him. Right. And for example, uh, well, I'll tell you a little, another little story. In the, what we used to, they used to refer to as the old Corps. The old Corps. In the Marine Corps, the pre not the pre World War Two. If you put in nineteen or twenty years, you might rise from private to gunnery sergeant or something like that. If you made sergeant major, it probably took you twenty five years or something. I went from private to sergeant major in nineteen months. That's how long I had in the service when I was a sergeant major. But I went to work for the general. And he found that everything he needed, I knew it before he did. And a lot of times, he would come out to my desk at, in the office in Hawaii there, and he would say, uh, I was just reading in one of the things that were passed around here about uh, something. And I'd like to have a couple of copies of that. Could you get them for me? And I'd say, have you looked in your in-basket today yet? And he'd say, no, and I'd say, they're in there. So I was always a step ahead of him, it seemed like. So he never had to think about it. And for the, all the time that I knew him, he never had an officer aide. And so the colonel that was the personnel director for the whole command, a colonel named O'Neill, and he was a good buddy of mine because I had served with him one time, you know, back earlier. And uh, so uh, he would come in and uh, frequently would come over and ask me a question about personnel assignments like that. And uh, uh, an example of that would be they didn't start women Marines in the Marine Corps until 1943. And so women Marines were something new. But the idea of them was great. And as in the other services, it worked fine. I saw it work in the Marine Corps. And so when I was back in, on, in the state, we started getting women Marines in. And of course, I wasn't anybody then. I wasn't a personnel officer or anything like that. I was corporal or sergeant or something. But I saw these women Marines coming in. But I saw how effectively this worked because in would come five or six women Marines. Two weeks later, that many of our big able-bodied men would be headed out the door, headed for overseas. And so the purpose was there, and, the, and it worked. And uh, so we had a lot of them assigned that way. Here are the first two women that were assigned to General Moore's office that you told me. Yeah. Those two women worked for you, and that was General Moore's birthday cake in Hawaii. Exactly. Uh huh. That's a picture of it right there. Okay. Was it weird having women coming in like that? It was. At first it was amazing, uh, very difficult. And uh, uh, one of the things, of course, that all of the military service, various departments had, Army, Navy, Air Corps, whatever, was the security for the ladies. Because okay. you couldn't put them in the barracks with a bunch of men. 
And so they always had to get, like take a separate uh, barracks and make it the women's barracks. But they had to have security guards around and <laughs> like that because they didn't want guys slipping right. in the back door or climbing in the windows and like that. And so the security of the ladies was always primary. And uh, then we, uh, uh, after we started getting more and more of the women in, they formed a women marine detachment on the base out there in Hawaii. And the woman marine major and very soon lieutenant colonel that was in command of the, of the women's barracks there, that was her sole responsibility. And so the, we finally reached a high point of having 95 women there, and she was their commanding officer as far as barracks, uh, controlling their liberty and all sorts of things like that. But the real boss then was the, whoever she worked for in, the, in our headquarters there. And uh, so that was a very functional thing. Were you cleared for top secret stuff under General Moore? Oh yeah. Uh, there was no way you could work for him without having. Mm -hmm. And so on top of top secret, I had cryptographic clearance, okay. which was, you probably know what yeah. that is. So I had top secret cryptographic and that's as high as it goes, you know. So there were no documents that I couldn't handle and didn't handle. And uh, so you saw all the plans for all the major battles that were upcoming oh, yeah. and knew mm -hmm. about it beforehand? Yeah. And so uh, this captain I told you that he had, it was a lawyer, right. and was assigned as his aide. That very factor you just mentioned cost him his career. And so we were uh, the captain had told me if I would come up and work in the legal office for three months and get him caught up, he was transferring then to the South Pacific. He'd already talked to the general about me, and the general just said, I want him. So when I got on a ship and went to the South Pacific, when the ship landed, he was there at the dock, this captain was, to meet me, to take me over to meet the general. I didn't know what the captain's relationship with the general was, but I never liked this captain because of his flippant attitude and his lawyer, I'm superior to everybody else and like that. And I never met a single soul during my association with him that liked him. And so uh, the general really disliked him. And uh, so anyway, he met me at the dock and drove me over to the general's headquarters. So we drove up in front of the building and stopped. I got out of the jeep on one side, he got out on the other side. And he was going to make a production of this. The general was sitting in this doorway of this building, the office building. Uh, he had a, just a desk just inside the door. He was sitting there working, doing paperwork, whatever. And I think probably, he probably looked up when he saw the jeep approaching and saw that it was the captain driving. And so that guy with him is obviously me, because that's who he went to get. And so we pulled up there and we got out of the jeep. And he walked up there, and he was going to make a production of this. General, I want you to meet. Hmm. Mm -hmm. He pulled up there, and he got, I think he got general out. And the general looked up and said, you, get out of here. I want to talk to him. And I thought, well, I guess you don't have a very good relationship with the general. <laughs> so I went in. Walked up to the desk and snapped to attention there, and he said, sit down, I want to talk to you. So he told me then of his situation. You know, I don't dictate the machines, I don't dictate the people and like that. I want to just tell you what I want to say in a letter. You fix it, and I sign it, and you mail it. Can you handle that? Yes, sir.
You got the job. So where was this? I mean, you're not in Hawaii anymore. No, you're no, this in... was way down on the South Pacific. Okay. Yeah, one of the islands in the okay. South Pacific. So I got the job, and I stayed with him until he retired. At the end of 1946, he retired. And, uh, but we spent most of it in the Pacific out there. We, uh, he had his own airplane, own C-47 plane assigned to him, his own flight crew. Here's a picture that you had, and this is um, General Moore. You mm. told me this was Louis Merritt? Yeah, that was a... Uh, and he, you were underneath the general's wing of the airplane with battle plans for Okinawa or somewhere. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, this General Merritt was a uh, one-star. He eventually became a three-star. Wallace was a okay. three-star, and he wound up being assistant commandant and director of marine aviation. And uh, So what rank are you here? Uh, at this point, I was... Uh, I can't really see that. I, I was probably a first sergeant then, okay. uh, or a sergeant major. And that was the highest enlisted rank. And this is the general getting off his airplane. Did you fly on that airplane with the general? Yeah. I, I flew and lived on the plane with the general. Okay. And we had some interesting things there. When we were at Peleliu, uh we flew in there. And, of course, the fighting is going on this, in this battle into the island. The troops... Replacement troops were back this way, and so they would have to move the replacement troops up to the battle area right. and bring the ones that were being relieved back. And so at about the halfway point, the general's plane was parked here. And so I would be sitting under the wing of the airplane. and. On one of these islands, there was a uh, army major that we had a joint staff for some of these operations. Mm -hmm. And so it would be Marine Corps led. The general would be the big boss. And the, uh, if he had a, an assistant uh, general as his assistant, it would be a brigadier general, one, one star general. And uh, so then we would have a joint staff frequently. And like in this particular case I'm talking about, we had an army colonel, a wonderful guy, but he was so senior that he, in the entire U.S. Army worldwide, he was the number six colonel in the whole, his name, his last name was, was Bridget, Bernard Bridget, wonderful officer like that, and he became what the general called his chief of staff. Okay. And so then he brought in a few people, and there was like a Navy captain, which is the equal of a Marine colonel, and then he brought in this Army major to be an ordnance officer. This Army major was a good guy, young, young fella. And so at this island, wherever we were there, the Army had seen fit, or the it was War Department in those days, not right. the Department of Defense. They'd seen fit to put a, a depot there, and they had uniforms, supplies, anything you could think of they had, but except it was Army. So you, it didn't do you much good to go in there and get an uh, uniform because it was Army uniform, and you couldn't wear it in the Marine Corps. But uh, we benefited in a lot of ways. And so we had our plane parked there. So this first thing this Army Major did, that was on our staff, went up there and he discovered that they had a brand new portable typewriter. And you could take the top up and there's a beautiful typewriter there. You could take the bottom loose, oh, and here's four legs. So you could set that thing up in front of you and sit there and type just like it was on a desk or something like that, see. So he went up there and got one and brought it to me. And I thought, man, is that, I've got it made now, see. And so then, this uh, sergeant, staff sergeant, that was our navigator on the plane, 
He was an expert at getting stuff for nothing. And he went up there to that depot up there and told whoever was in charge or whoever was issuing uniforms. He went up there and told them that the general had sent them up there to get new uniform equipment for the guys on his crew. And the guy said, well, that'd be fine, but these are Army uniforms. The Marines don't wear Army uniforms. But that wasn't the idea. The guy was angling. You know, those. you may have seen them. They were flight jackets. They were dark colored leather, and they had a fur collar right. on them. Yeah. Well, in war, at World War II time and like that, that was the rage of the world. If you had one of those, you were something. Right. He went up there and he came back with a big cart and he must have had 25 of those things. <laughs> they, he told them the general wanted 25 of them. <laughs> and so he was an expert at that. And so he brought all this stuff back and gave, you know, each one of us got one of our size and like mm -hmm. that. Then you traded it off. Mm -hmm. Tell us what, tell me what that is. That is what's known as a piece of shrapnel. Uh, if you are shooting artillery shells and like that, when they hit and explode, they break up into pieces. There may be bigger pieces mm -hmm. like that, but that's a piece of shrapnel. Where did it come from? Well, this one has an interesting background. <laughs> <laughs> we were at, I don't, know what, I don't remember what island it was. Peleliu. Yeah, but anyway, most of these islands down there, I think I said this already, despite the fact there's Pacific Ocean out there, there would be this fresh water source in the middle of that island, because mm -hmm. that's what the people drank. Otherwise, they would have had to process the salt water to get the salt out so they could drink it. And so uh, uh, here at this particular island, there was this beautiful pond, just gorgeous looking lagoon there. And at this end there was decorations and, and beautiful flowers growing and like that. It was just a piece of serenity. Mm -hmm. And so over here, 30 or 40 feet, was the general's office and our camp there. And the troops, we had a lot of troops with us, of course, but they were down here, uh, you know, 200 yards or something like that. No flowers down there. And uh, so uh, we really had it made there. And so one of the first things that this Army Major I was telling you about, he went up there to that place and he had seen me. I had a portable typewriter, but it didn't have legs or anything like that. Hey, Doc, go back, go back and tell us about the shrapnel. Hmm? You're telling us about the shrapnel. Oh, let me finish. Yeah, let me that. finish on the shrapnel. The general and I used to meet every morning at eight o'clock, and where we met, he was the only one that had a tent on the island because he was the general. Mm -hmm. So we had a nice tent for him here. The rest of us slept on sleeping bags on the on the ground like that, and so. Here was this top secret trailer with all this communication stuff in it. And so we wanted to protect that because it was, that was the heart of our communication system. And everything that went through there was top secret practically. So uh, the CBs had been come in and were working on the airfield because the Americans, in taking the island in the first place, had blown up the airfield. Mm -hmm. So the Seabees came in and leveled everything out and put that, you've seen, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but they had this stuff they could hook together More and it matting. made like a metal airfield yeah. almost. Matting. On top of the coral. And the planes could come in and land and take off and so on. And, on. and so the general had his tent there. And then there was that communications thing. And so there was a, the, I had the Seabees come in and they drove these stakes in the ground. There were steel stakes about, oh gosh, they were at least a half, three quarters of an inch in diameter. Uh, 
for thickness. And at the top, they had a loop on them. And so I asked the Seabees to come in and put these stakes all the way around that top secret trailer there. And then they put a cord around so that people just can walk right up through there. They could duck and go under it like that, but they'd have had a problem because about every 10 feet was a guard there with a machine gun. And so they would have had a problem to try to do something with the, with the equipment like that. But the general's tent was right there, and he's the only one that had a tent. So I told him, I said, I've set up a deal with you. I'm going to call you every morning at 7.30, and the steward there will bring you your breakfast. At about 8, 8.15, 8.30, I want to meet you in your office. And he said, wait a minute, where's my office? And I said, you see that rope that goes around there? You see there's a knot tied in that place? That's your office. That knot is your office. I want you to meet me there every morning at 8 o'clock. During the night, I will have reviewed all the messages coming in. And because it was a battle situation, Gosh, every two minutes, here would come another message, and they would all be top secret. But it would say, Squad A moved 10 feet to the left, or 12 feet to the right. And I told the general, I don't think you're much interested in that. Now, if you say that the whole company was overrun by Japanese, now you could get interested in that in a hurry. See? So I said, I don't want these communications people waking you up all night. Every 15 minutes, you just get to sleep. Got a top secret message on and it says, yeah, they moved two feet to the left. So he said, good idea. We'll meet at 8 o'clock every morning at my office. And that office was the knot in the rope. So when he'd get up in the morning, I would, during the night, the communications chief and I would review these messages. And the only ones that he needed to see would be on a clipboard here. And if there were any that were especially important, I probably would have awakened him. Right. But if there were some that were pretty important, I'd put those on top. And so I'd always tell him, here they are. The further you go down, the less important they are. And so he would sit there, and in 15 minutes, he'd get caught up with what happened last night. And, uh, so we had a real, really tight working relationship and like that. And uh, so the uh, personnel colonel came in one time, and of course this personnel colonel was my buddy, but he went to the journal. Uh, to, well, Doc, tell us about the shrapnel. How did you get that piece of shrapnel? Oh, okay. I forgot to tell about that. Uh, the uh, general and I were out there at our meeting point. In the office. And uh, I was showing him what had happened last night and so forth. And so he's standing here, and I'm standing like this, and we were probably two feet apart. And I'm telling him things that had happened, or maybe showing him something that had happened like that. And we didn't know it, but over here, about 50, 60 yards, there was an underground ammunition depot that the Japanese had there. The 1st Marine Division intelligent people decided later, after this event, that the Japanese had set that thing up and had it ready to blow up because they had found out from, you know, the Japanese had let them know, hey, man, things are going bad, <laughs> you know get everything booby-trapped like that because they're going to be at your island and, and, you know, you can try to surrender, but they don't take prisoners. <laughs> so, you know, get ready to blow everything up. And so we didn't know anything about that. And, and we don't, I, I guess to this date, I don't know whether it actually was true, but it, I am inclined to believe it because of what happened. So I was there with the general running through some of this stuff. 
and this monster explosion went off back here. I mean, that island just rocked like this. And uh, so uh, I think he hollered, hit the deck at the same time I did, and we both headed for the same plot of ground. So we didn't hit heads, but we just hit like this. And just about that time, that piece of shrapnel that he just showed you there, apparently from one of these bombs, must have gone just almost straight up and now came straight down. And as he and I were going down like this, that thing touched the top of my head up. I can still have a little bump there, but it didn't hit me actually, but it did raise one drop of blood. But that was the extent of it. It didn't hurt me or anything like that. But when we landed, that piece of shrapnel landed right there between us. And brilliant me picked it up. And it just went, cooked the inside of my hand. Of course, I threw it down. And the doctor and his chief coroner were standing 15 feet away, and they saw this happen. And so, among other things that this doctor had, since he was the medical department, and he was out there in a war zone with the general and like that, well, people that are going to get injured are going to come in there to be treated. Mm -hmm. if, it was, if they got shot by a Japanese soldier, that was a war wound. Purple Heart. Well, thinking ahead of time, he took a foot logger full of uh, Purple Hearts out there with him. So I didn't think anything about it at the time. But I picked that thing up and then I, of course I threw it down, but it had burned the inside of my hand. He went over, well first of all he came over and fixed my hand and put medicine on it and so forth and wrapped it and like that. But then I saw him go over and he was talking to, to the general. But they were both looking, you know, they were talking together, but they kept looking over there like this where I was and like that. And I thought, I wonder what those birds are talking about. So in a few minutes, the doctor came over and said, in about 20 minutes, the general's going to have a little ceremony over here. We're going to muster a few troops, some of my corpsmen and like that, and we're going to muster a few troops here, and the general's going to have an award ceremony. Fine, that's great. And he said, well, the awards is this. He's going to award you the Bronze Star Medal and the Purple Heart Medal. And I said, Purple Heart? What for? And he said, you were wounded in action. And I said, I was not. I wasn't wounded in action. I was a stupid person that picked up a piece of shrapnel that I knew was hot before I picked it up. So uh, anyway, the general came over shortly. And he said, uh, we're going to have a ceremony here in a few minutes. And uh, we're going to give you a Purple Heart. So I said to him, General, we've been together quite a while, and I hope we stay together for a long time. But you're not going to live long enough to ever give me a Purple Heart for what happened here today. If you think you're going to give me a Purple Heart, you've got another thing coming. Excuse me the way I said that, but that's the way I feel. He said, that's your final decision? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, case closed. And I never got the Purple Heart. But I've used that a lot of times when I was talking to groups and talking. And I'd tell them that story. And I'd say, now I want a showing of hands here. First of all, how many of you think I made a mistake? And then, how many of you think I did the right thing? And it was amazing, about 80% of the people thought I made a mistake. Really? That I should have taken it. And the others, and of course I'd always say to the group that said I shouldn't take it, thank you, I agree with you, 
For you other guys, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> this is a picture of the general's airplane. Now, that's the one that you flew. Show it, hold it up. Mm -hmm. That's the one that you flew. That's uh, number one on the front. It's a DC-3. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that you flew all during the war with him on that one. Exactly. Mm-hmm. All right, and then this one is where you were, you had just landed, and you said this is General Moore, mm -hmm. and on the far left or far right over here is Pappy Boyington. Yes, that's correct. Now, Pappy Boyington won the Medal of Honor. Yeah. he uh, Was he a good guy? He was a wonderful guy. There were two people in the Marine Corps that shot down 26 Japanese airplanes in World War II. So they were fantastic. They were taken back to... Washington and President Truman put the Medal of Honor on both of them. Governor Foss, I mean, uh, he was a major right. at the time. Major Foss, he was a captain when he earned the medal, major when he got it. He was went on and later become governor of South Dakota. But the only reason he got it was his popularity and Medal of Honor and all that right. stuff. If he had not had that notoriety, he couldn't have been dog catcher of South Dakota. But uh, anyway, twice during my career working for the general, I got stuck with Joe Foss. He would come in and come in to see the general. And then the general would say to him, well, I want you to go over here and address a bunch of guys over here and over there and address a bunch of guys. And I would would be your, I'll be your guide and your okay. driver. Wait, is that support? And so I would take him out and put him in the car and we'd drive over to point A and he'd get up and give his talk and point B and give his talk and I'd bring him back. We had so much in common in that I was from South Dakota. Anyway, uh, Foss uh, was to go on and become a governor of, Cal of uh, South Dakota, but he only got it because of his notoriety in the military. But twice I had been assigned by the general to do things with him and for him when he was out there. And he was the most stuck up self-centered individual I ever met. And I hated to even admit that I was from South Dakota. But of course, the first time I met him, he said he was from Sioux Falls. And I said, well, by coincidence, I'm from South Dakota. I'm from Elk Point. And he, oh, I know where that is, you know. But he was just overwhelmed with himself. Contrast, Pappy Boyington, was a squadron commander out there. He shot down 26 planes also, and he also got the Medal of Honor from Truman. But I met him, and I got to know him on a personal basis. When he came back from overseas, I was at the training center in San Diego, where all the returning troops came through, and we had spatial arrangements made for all of them. And then for the officers coming back, they would come in and I would interview them. And there were some forms I filled out. And that information not only was for us, but they would immediately wire that to Washington, to the D Division of uh, Personnel, Director of Personnel up there. And they would be updated on the guy and the fact that he was back, had reported back in the US and was being processed. And he would already have his orders to whatever base he was going to next. But then I would make arrangements for the transportation. Most of the time I didn't have much to do because most of the time, you know, he was out there and the family was back there. But they would decide that when they got back, that in getting back to North Carolina, they would stop at different places along the way right. and live it up getting dad back and so on. So I could make a lot of the arrangements for her. And uh, so we had a good time processing through, but the comparison of Foss to Borington, it was, it was daylight and dark. 
and uh, Boyington was just a jewel. Now, here's a picture when you were in Hawaii, and uh, this is your bronze star. It's over here. Yeah. This is your bronze star mm -hmm. ceremony, and that's mm -hmm. you standing right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And then here's the general actually giving you actually, your medal. Yeah, actually pinning it on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. And you won the bronze star mm -hmm. for Peleliu? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, so a bronze star was a pretty turn nice medal. Turn that around and show it to the camera. Though. Yeah. All right, next one. You got it? Okay. And the bronze star you got in pe for Peleliu. Yeah. The, uh, the pecking order on medals, I won't go the whole way, but you could start with some kind of a service medal at the bottom, and there's the Medal of Honor at the right. top, and all these medals in between, see. So there's a medal, there's the Bronze Star Medal, and then there's, there's a Legion of Merit Medal. And the Legion of Merit is for officers because it's designed for, it's really primarily for people that were in command situation like that. Mm -hmm. And if you ran a battalion or a regiment or something in combat and you did it so well that they excelled and, and killed the Japanese and like that, you'd get the Legion of Merit if you were an officer. And so I think I may have started this, and it was kind of a cruel thing to say, but I started calling it the Officer's Good Conduct Medal because they got it automatically. Yeah. And when they would come back through the processing center in San Diego, we'd look in the record book there, see? And if they didn't have a Legion of Merit and they had satisfactorily served over there, the secretary would type a thing, and the general would sign it, and they'd award him the Legion of Merit. See, so I started calling it the Officer's Good Conduct Medal, and it wasn't a very popular term amongst the officers, but it was quite accurate. Was this mostly senior officers, like majors, lieutenant colonels, Not, uh, and both? Usually, yes. Yeah. And uh, but it uh, it would include probably captains at least, okay. and. Uh, now, Dot, you said that you served with General Moore all through the service. That's a picture of him, you said, was when he was addressing the troops when he retired. Yes. Uh -huh. And you were with him when he... When he yes. Was oh, yeah. He, uh, as I told you, he had uh, graduated from the Naval Academy way back in the 20s. And uh, so when uh, World War II ended... Uh, well, let me start this over again. When World War II started, you had the problem of getting people into the service. Right. And uh, the Marine Corps was the last one to take draftees. The Army, Air Corps, and Navy, it finally got to the point where they had to get draft them into those services. And uh, so the Marines usually could get enough. In enlistments. But then when the Marines started getting big, when the war started, there were only 120,000 Marines in the whole world. And that was their authorized strength from Congress. They went to two million during the war. And so when the war ended, the problem then become, how do you get rid of them? The same problems you had getting them in is getting them out. Because you didn't you couldn't just shut down the Marine Corps, so you had to do it in some orderly fashion. So I came with an, up with an idea to take a sheet of paper, a form, put the person's name, serial number, and so on on it, and then how long were you in the service? How many months were you in the service? And there was a blank space and you could put 14 times 10. Give them 10 months, 10 points for each month, mm -hmm. 140 points. How long were you overseas in months? Times 10 or five or something, another one. How often did you do this or how many medals did you get and this and so on? 
And then it all added up down at the bottom up here. And I told them, that's how you get them out of the service. They were drafted in, draft them out. And so all they had to do, they came in, just staggered in. But now you could reward the ones that had done it. If you'd been overseas fighting and like that, you deserved to go home first. Right. If that's what you wanted to do, was go home. If you want to stay in the service, then you're back here telling people, I want to stay in, you know, how can I stay? And so that's the way we got rid of them then. And it started out like the people that have X number of points, just say 100, get to go out the first of next month. The people that have 90 points, okay. two weeks later. 80 points, two weeks later. Right on down like that. So were you in California when you were doing this, or were you at Headquarters Marine Corps when well, you were doing Well, it was sort of a combination thing. Uh, the representatives of the director of personnel of the Marine Corps were coming out into the field okay. and doing a lot of this stuff. But they had heard that I had come up with this system for processing people within the Marine Air Wing out there. And so they came down to see me. Uh, I think two lieutenant colonels and a couple of majors, and they came down to see me and, how do you do it? Or, you know, how do you handle it? Mm -hmm. Like that. So I showed them that point system thing, and they took it back to Washington and showed it to the director of personnel, uh, not director of personnel, director of marine aviation first. And of course he knew me and said, good idea, took it to the director of personnel and they put it in effect for the whole Marine Corps. And uh, so then that made an orderly way of getting the people out. So is that what got you to, uh, you were, where, were you, where was the, I, the tour with the IG in all this, the Inspector General? Oh, that came quite a while later. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I was, uh, I had been out in, in uh, Pacific for a long time and then I went back and I was in Hawaii there for quite a long time. And, uh, but I got word through General Wallace, he was director of aviation in Washington, that I was gonna be transferred to Cherry Point, North Carolina. And uh, he notified me, he and his wife notified me personally because she came to me out in Hawaii and came over and said, Ken, I wanna ask you a question. I know you're going to Cherry Point and Bill's going to Cherry Point. That was General Wallace. Bill is going to Cherry Point. You're going to get there the same day practically. Will you do for your for him what you do for General Moore out here? And I said, of course. I may do even more for him back there. Who knows? But I certainly will do no less. And so she said, great. And so when I got back there, he came in and became the commanding general. And uh, we had a great time there together. He stayed there for, I think, 14 or 16 months, and then was transferred somewhere else, and another general came in. And uh, So what rank were you at this point? Because you were commissioned somewhere. Well, most of this time, right? I was a sergeant major. Okay. And then, in uh, 19... Let's see, I came in in 42. In 1951, I would have had nine years in the service, I guess. Uh, the, uh, a general by the name of Woods, three-star general from Washington, had come in and was now the director of marine aviation. Okay. Well, it just so happened, here was another case. I had hand-nursed General Woods in his earlier days. And so he had a really good liking for me. And so uh, uh, he was director of marine aviation in Washington. And so uh, I think just before I had 10 years in, a program came out from Washington saying that staff non-commissioned officers, 
that would be Staff Sergeant and above, who had outstanding records, outstanding this, outstanding, everything had to be just mm -hmm. uh, If they were recommended by their commanding officer or their commanding general, they could be awarded a field commission okay. and become a second lieutenant out there in the field. You didn't have to go back to OCS or anything like Officer Candidate School, yeah. anything like that. They just took your stripes off and put bars on you and you were an officer. And so General Woods, three star, was a director of Marine Aviation. And uh, so I was always so pleased that he did this. Uh, he always told me that he didn't do it just for me because the aviators that were in Washington, in order to get in their flight time each month, because they had to fly at least four hours a month in order to get their flight pay, which was a couple of hundred bucks a month. So they had found that to get their four hours in, a good way to do it was to fly from Anacostia Air, from Airfield right there in Washington to Cherry Point, four hour flight. And they'd get their flight time in for the month. And uh, so uh, anyway, uh, this program was coming out where officers that were, uh, or were staff, staff non-commissioned officers with 10 years of service could be awarded a field commission. No OCS or anything yeah. like that. And you would, if you weren't in a field that was authorized, like I was in personnel and administration, and in the listing it was number one, number 01, and your classification number for your job, like as a sergeant major, I was an 0148. As an officer, I would be 0130. And it looked like a lower number, but it was actually a higher assignment like that. And uh, so uh, anyway, I wanted to put in for it. You could apply for it if you wanted to, but commanding officers were off authorized to just go ahead and recommend you whether you put in for it yourself or not. And so uh, General Woods was three-star general, uh, director of Marine Aviation. And I was sergeant major at, I guess it was Cherry Point, somewhere, I think it was Cherry Point Probably, when it happened. Yeah. And so uh, a lot of the pilots flying stationed at Marine Corps headquarters flew to Cherry Point to get their flight time for the month. And so uh, uh, they normally would land at Cherry Point, get a cup of coffee and talk to some of their buddies, get in the plane and fly back to Washington. So uh, I was at the office there and uh, secretary came in and apparently she had been told by General Woods, do not tell him who's, who's here. Just tell him he has a visitor. So the secretary came in and said, uh, could you step in the outer office here? Or you have a visitor out here. And to keep me from saying to her, who is it? She just said, you have a visitor out here. And she was gone. And I walked out there and there standing, standing is Lieutenant General Woods. And he said, I have a present for you here. And I said, Fantastic, what is it? And he gave me my permanent commission so that I would be forever be an officer. What was it like to go from sergeant major to second lieutenant, I mean, in terms of status? Well, uh, the salary was, like going from sergeant major to that, was not the salary difference was to second lieutenant, was all that, wasn't all that much because the sergeant major was sort of the top of the line and the right. second lieutenant was the bottom of the officers. Uh, it may have been 50 bucks or something like that. But of course, getting on that pay scale was a lot better because you had a lot further to right. go. And, uh, 
and then you served, uh, when you got your commission, you went to the Naval Air Station in Memphis. Yes. And why did you go there? Well, that was the first question I had. Uh, I was in the 1st Marine Division at Camp Pendleton, California, Oceanside, mm -hmm. California. And uh, they had had a major problem with personnel problems in their service battalion. And the service battalion was the battalion that did everything for the base. Mowed the lawns, you know, House planted people. trees, trimmed the trees, mm -hmm. uh, kept the buildings, painted the buildings and all that. It was a service battalion. And they had a lot of people there. They had probably 400 people in that thing. And they had always just been miserable with their administration. But they had never had, really, they had a sergeant major and a commanding officer, but they never had a professional administrator in the thing. And so up at the division level in personnel, the personnel director was a colonel, but he had several assistants. And one of them was a captain's billet. And it just so happened that one of my buddies he was one number senior to me in the lineal list of officers. He was working as assistant personnel officer out there. And he worked with assignment of officers, ground officers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he and I had been buddies for years. And uh, so uh, he would call me almost every day, or I'd call him and we'd shoot the breeze about things in general and like that. So he called me one day and said, uh, what are you doing? And I said, working, you know. He said, why don't you come on up to my office and have some coffee? So I said, okay. So I jumped in the car and went up there. And he was waiting at the door and he says, come on, let's go back to the office. But instead he took me to the conference room and they had a whole group, the commanding general and like that were all there. And uh, they had, uh, I don't know why, permanent promotion or my promotion to captain or promotion to, it was some big deal. Right. And it had come in and so they decided to surprise me and bring me up there and honor me up there. And, uh, yeah, but why did you go to the Naval Air Station in Memphis? Oh, I was there at Camp Hedl, and I was happy as a lark. We had that outfit that had been having trouble for years, and it was just up and zing, man. It was working like a charm. And I was really happy with the results. I couldn't believe how well that thing was running. And uh, Well, Dawg, you left Cherry Point and went to Memphis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But why did you go to Memphis? Why were they building up in Memphis? The uh, Korean War had started. And so they decided that they needed tons more of people with like electronics skills and the various schools that they had at Memphis, metal smith and, and engine mechanics and stuff like helicopter mechanics. And so uh, when I got the orders, I called, I told my buddy and personnel, you know, get them canceled. And he called back shortly and said, mm -mm, they aren't canceling these babies. And so the colonel and I went up there, my boss, and, and uh, they explained to me that uh, Memphis has 250 people right now. Six months from now, they're going to have 2,600. That means you've got to have barracks, location, arrange for mess halls. Just think, you know, if you're taking care of 260 people and all of a sudden you have to take care of 10 times more. So I said, yeah, but why me? And they said, well, we figured you're the logical guy to do it. Every time you face a problem, you face it and you get it done. And that's why you got picked for the job. And no, you can't get out of it. What time frame was this? What year was this? 1960, I guess it was. 19, 
61? No, 51, because you meant Tissy. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah back off 10 yeah, years. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, uh, and that's where you met your wife in Memphis. Yes, mm-hmm, yeah. So I went out there, and when I got there, it was true. There were only 250 people there, and I had an office force of about 10 or something like that. And, uh, but true to their word, they said, when you get down there, analyze what you need and just tell us and we'll send them. And uh, so I decided that, you know, we're, I was going to need 10 barracks, so I was going to need 10 in top NCOs to be barracks bosses. And uh, it just analyzed the whole problem, and this is what I need, and they just kept feeding them in like that. But in the meantime, man, the people were coming from all over the Marine Corps to go to those schools and like that. And we went from 260 to 2600 in just a month and a half or two months. And uh, so uh, we laid on them, as, you know, and uh, they let me bring in a ton of Marine instructors, top non-commissioned officers and like that to be instructors in the courses that the Marines needed. And uh, so it so happened that uh, my wife's brother was a pilot in the Navy. He was a lieutenant in the Navy. And there was an officer's electronic school out there. And uh, it uh, lasted, for the, for the enlisted people, it was a 30-week course. For the officers, it was, I think, 16 weeks or something like that. And uh, so, uh, uh, Tissy's brother Bob was a pilot, and he was, he was also a student. He always wanted to be going to school for something. And so, uh, he came out there and wanted to know, what do I have to do to get to go to this school? And, so I told him how to apply and like that. And uh, so he uh, he got to school and came out there. And of course, he spent quite a bit of time in my, my office. But he, uh, for the officers that were pilots, of course, most of the time they were flying. And uh, so the officer's electronic school and the enlisted uh, school, the flight portion of it, excuse me, could be conducted at the same time when they were up flying around like that. And the officer's instructor could be up there instructing the pilots, and the enlisted instructor could be in the back instructing the enlisted okay. person. And uh, so we kind of streamlined the whole operation there to uh, get these two people through school faster. And, and Ken, when you left there, you worked for that, and then you went to Korea. Yeah. And you were there for the whole Korean conflict, and mm -hmm. you were the personnel director for the Marine Aviation Wing for the Korean War. Yeah, for the Korean War, yeah. All right, and then you left there, and you went to the Inspector General's office. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the Inspector General's office, you had to inspect every um, Embassy, embassy in the world, and you did all of those inspections yourself? Well, it was like this. Uh, the inspector general, uh, or the commandant of the Marine Corps, I should say, had an edict from the secretary of the Navy for the commandant of the Marine Corps to provide Marine detachments or Marine sentries to be guards at the embassies. And back at that time, you probably wouldn't have remembered this, but back at that time, they'd had a couple of incidents at embassies where some guy would walk in off the street into an embassy and shoot the guard, It'd be some civilian guard or something like that, and then go around and shoot the ambassador or shoot whoever he could shoot and take off. They'd had a couple of incidents like that. So the, I guess the answer to it was to provide Marine security guards 
at every embassy in the world. And so the Commandant of the Marine Corps made, put a school in Washington, D.C. there, and it was called Marine Security Guard School. And if you were selected for duty as a security guard at an embassy, you had to go to that school first. And they would teach you all everything about mm -hmm. embassies and like that, protocol and so forth. And then, hey, Doc, let me ask you this. When you left the embassy, when you inspected all, you, you traveled to 91 countries, yeah. inspected that, and then you came back and you worked at 8th and I. Yeah. And that's when President Kennedy came in, and that was the first president to come to the parade grounds and you were in charge of setting that up. Yeah. Tell mm -hmm. that story about meeting Kennedy and his rocking chair being there. Yeah. The uh, uh, John Kennedy was, of course, a great people's president. But as you know, he'd had that accident in PT 101, right. yeah. 109 in the Pacific. Pacific. And he himself was a decorated war hero. And uh, but he had this bad back from that incident. And so uh, he had he had trouble getting around. And he, it, he, you know, he could, at a ceremony like that, he could walk from here over there like that and it looked perfectly normal. But he would have to have somewhere to sit. He couldn't stand up for a long period of time. So anyway, the, the president very seldom ever came to the Marine Barracks. And so uh, I don't know who made the arrangement. I, it, I couldn't claim responsibility for that. But anyway, we were going to have, from April to September every year, we had parades on the parade ground there at the Marine Barracks at 8th and I. Mm -hmm. And they were something to see. If you thought you had ever seen a military parade or seen the military in action in a parade situation. They had a Marine silent drill team there that was second to none. And they were, there were, I think, 11 of them, I think wide, 11 in a row. But they had these M1 rifles with a, uh, the, everything that they needed to do the thing. And they would start that function at their show, and it would probably last 10 minutes. But you never saw those rifles stop. They were always in the air, like everybody's doing. But these guys would just be standing there, and they'd just go. They'd put their hand out, and donk, and a rifle would come in there. Donk, and, whoosh, and they'd throw theirs. And, and it was just, uh, you couldn't believe what you were seeing. See? So they did that every Friday night. Every Tuesday night, in downtown, not in downtown uh, Washington, but you went across the bridge, the 14th Street Bridge, to right. go into Washington. And at the first street, Constitution Avenue, you turned left and went way, way down to the end of it. And you were then again right on the river, on the Potomac River. And the Iwo Jima Memorial for the Marines was there. Huge thing, monster thing. And so on Tuesday nights, the Marines would send a special group over there to do their performance, the silent drill team and like that. And so Tuesday nights in Washington, D.C., it looked like everybody in Washington, D.C. came to that spot to see it because it was worth the effort to get there just to see what these guys could do. And I don't think in all the four years I did that, I ever saw one of those guys ever drop their rifle. Well, Dodd, tell about when Kennedy was there and his they had his rocking chair on stage. Yeah. And you had to you went down and sat in it. <laughs> this this was kind of funny. In the first place they had to protect the president right off the bat. So the Marine Barracks there, it was a city block big parade field the size of a football field in the middle. So if you went in the main gate, solid wood, or solid brick uh, barracks mm -hmm. and so forth across there, solid, same way, the offices and so forth of the commanding officer and like that were up in this left end up here. 
Along this end were three great big houses. And the end one was just unbelievably large. That was the commandant's house while he was commandant. The next one was the assistant commandant. The next one was the director of marine aviation. Those were those three important houses. Then there were five barracks, uh, nice houses like that along here. And these were for the bachelor officers that had all these functions. Many of them were aid to the Secretary of the Navy, aid to the Secretary of Commerce. They had all, all over Congress, all over the, the cabinet and like that, they had positions like that. And so that was their function, but that's where they lived. They were all bachelors when they started. And if they got married, they still retained their room there because they had to have their uniforms there and like that at all times. They might live in an apartment or a house in Washington, but that's where they had to retain their stuff for the parade field and like that. Well, Doug, get back to when President Kennedy came in the, yeah. in the chair. So they announced that for the first that. time in years and years and years, President Kennedy, the President of the United States, and it happened to be Kennedy, was going to come over and be the review of the parade. Well, we were used to having congressmen and senators and cabinet members and like that, or the mayor of the District of Columbia, anybody that you could think of that was a big shot, they would bring them in to be the reviewing officer and like that. And so, uh, uh, they decided to ask the president if he would like to do it. And so he had a military background. You know, he'd been in the Navy right. and like that. And so he accepted. And so the parade was going to be like 10 days from now on a Friday night. So they started putting up protective gear. Now the Marine barracks, the right end of it was all barracks building. So you didn't have you didn't have any wall for people to climb over. No, you told us that part. Talk oh. about when Kennedy got there. Okay. So Kennedy comes on the parade field. Yeah. So he came, and as part of the preparation for getting him there, probably three or four days ahead of time, uh, somebody decided, or he decided himself, probably. You know, at that parade, Friday night, I, that's something I really want to do, but I don't think I can stand up, you know, for the hour of that parade. I want my chair over there from the White House, see. And you probably never saw the chair. Most of nobody ever saw it in person. In pictures, yeah. But, God, it was a big plush thing, black leather and like that. Huge thing, high back, I don't like that. And so uh, uh, he said that he would have his chair sent over there for that parade Friday night. And they would send it over ahead of time so it would be there for Friday night. And when he got there, he didn't have to worry about it. When he walked out there, there would be the chair at the appropriate place. And so uh, the uh, Friday that before the parade, the afternoon, I would always go around out there and check the parade field. Every detail and like that. Check between the houses and like that, and make sure everything was clean and neat and so on. And that the, whatever equipment needed to be out there for the reviewing officer was there and just attended to the detail. In the middle, about on the 50-yard line, I'll call it, the middle of the field, we had a little set of bleachers. We had some big bleachers. We could put in 3,500 people in there. But here was a set of special bleachers. These were VIP bleachers. And we could put 50 people in there, in this set of bleachers. And so you could imagine if the president is going to be the reviewing officer, 
every congressman and like that wants a seat in that place up there. So all we could do practically was take them according to when they called Nash for the seat. Except we would always make it a point, Speaker of the House, right. a top guy in the Senate, like that, we always had a reservation for them. The Secretary of the Navy, the Secretary of the Army, Secretary of the Air Force, like certain VIPs always had a, an arrangement there. And, uh, but uh, they just sort of assigned me as the ambassador to make certain that all the details were taken care of and that the parade went off nicely. And it, so it wasn't much of an effort for me. The president's band was going to be the musician. I didn't really have to say much for them. I could go up to the band director and our buddies, but I'd say, don't forget Friday night. He'd say, okay. He wouldn't even say what time or anything. <laughs> He'd just say, I'm ready. And that would be it. And so then we'd have all the details taken care of. And things would happen according to the schedule and like that. And when the things started, then they, the uh, this special firing squad, the rifle squad, would put on their act and then whatever was next and so forth. And then the actual parade would start. And the troops from the Marine barracks would form in platoon formation and they would march up and across and huh. And when they'd pass a reviewing stand, they would do their eyes right and, mm -hmm. and salute and so on. And, and uh, oh, Dahl, when you got, um, when you got the chair that was up there, it was Kennedy's chair, you went down and sat down in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why did you sit down in Kennedy's chair? Well, what happened, I'll tell you this. There was a reporter for the Washington Post, the main Washington newspaper, and she was a hatchet woman. And her desire was always to tear people down. And so she liked nothing more than taking on, you know, the head guy in the Senate or, or the vice president or whatever. And she'd write some column about something that would be bad about them rather than something really good about them. I can't remember her name to save my life. But she had this, she had just established a reputation, a reputation as a hatchet woman. I'd never seen her before, never, I knew her name, but I'd never seen her before. And so the president, it was Friday, and the president was going to be over there at seven o'clock to review the parade. So I went over to check the grounds and so forth at two o'clock in the afternoon. And the White House had sent the president's chair over there this special chair he wore that supported his back and like that. The one that came right out of the Oval Office, it was his chair. And so the company had come up with the truck and drove in the main gate of the post. And uh, I guess somebody, I had instructed the people there that where it was going to go out there. So they put the chair there. And so Typically then, I would put signs on chairs such as that, and I would put President so-and-so, or Vice President so-and-so, or Mayor so-and-so, whatever the titles were, on all of the VIP things like that. And of course, part of the time, Kennedy would be out there. But most of the time he'd be up on the reviewing stand right. because the troops were going to march by and so forth and salute him and like that. But that was all details we had worked out in advance. And of course, he was thoroughly briefed. And he did it three times during that one parade season, so he knew what was going on. So uh, three days before the parade, I went over there. And Lord, here was the Secret Service out there, had people out there, and the 16-foot high fence, they blocked that to the ground with, let me just say cardboard, I don't know what, it may have been plastic or something, 
up to the ed to the roof up equal to the height of the roof and it so it came from this end across all the way across and then down and hooked onto the end of the building down here so when you went by there it was like looking at a box right. and there was a gate here but if the president was in there that gate was going to be closed and two security guards with a machine gun standing there see so all the security in the world was going to be on the marine barracks that night and uh, and it was but I went out there that day to make sure that that chair was in the right place. I had never met that hatchet woman writer, but I knew well of her fame and, or I wouldn't call it fame, but her notoriety. So I'm standing there by that chair. It's not even faced the right direction and it's 30 feet out from where it's gonna be that night. But it's two o'clock in the afternoon, so we don't worry about that at this point. But all I was doing was making sure that the dang chair was there. Mm -hmm. And we knew the White House was gonna take care of the details. When the parade ended, I didn't have to worry about that chair. The White House people just glommed that thing and zoom. And before the president got back to the White House, his chair was back there. and. Uh, but you sat in it? Yeah, but anyway, the, the chair was out there. And so I went out there and we put the this beautiful inscribed card on there and it said, President, whatever his name was, President so-and-so. And I was standing there just admiring that chair and thinking, this is where the President of the United States sits. And I had actually seen the chair at the White House one time on taking a tour of the White House, but I never thought I'd be near it mm -hmm. or be handling it or be responsible for it. And so uh, I was standing there and this woman walked up. I didn't know who she was, but obviously with the security we had there, she must have presented some security to the guy at the gate or they, she wouldn't have been in there. And uh, so she walked up and was stand there looking at the chair. President uh, Kennedy. Kennedy. So she said, why don't you sit down on this chair and let me take your picture? And if I had told her what I really thought, it wouldn't have been printable. But I told her, I said, don't be absurd. I wouldn't do that. She says, come on, I want to take your picture in the president's chair. It'd be a nice thing for you to have, you know. You can show your kids someday and like that. And I thought, you witch, that'll be on tomorrow morning's Atlanta newspaper on the front page. That's what she was really looking right. for, see. And so uh, she asked me again, and I finally told her, there's the gate, leave. And she did. And of course, I never sat in the chair. And, uh, but that night, of course, we had it there for him. And uh, when the parade started, that's where he was, out there. And then he knew, and he had it, we had a guy to ask, uh, one of the lieutenant colonels escorted him back to the reviewing stand. And uh, so they helped him. You had to climb a kind of a steep set of stairs to get up on there. So they helped him get up on there and uh, that, that evening they did. And he reviewed the troops and so forth. And then when it was over with, they brought him down off there we're, we're going to have to move toward closing here because the battery and the camera is starting to run down. But what I don't want to close without hearing a little bit about your life after the Marine Corps. I know you have at least one child. <laughs> yes. Well, I, uh, I had some interesting things to do. Uh, when I got out, of course, I had 
all this administrative experience and so forth. And so uh, uh, in California, unlike I'll say the rest of the United States, uh, I guess I could say everything west of the Mississippi handles title insurance the way they handle it in California. Everything east, it's handled by attorneys. And there are title companies, but they don't have sales representatives out selling their product and like that, and they'd handle it completely different. And the title company itself does not issue the title policy that a guy gets when he buys a house. The attorneys issue the policy. And of course, he, they issued the policy and get paid by the insurance company and uh, deliver it to the guy mm -hmm. that buys the house like that. Out on the West Coast, they handle it differently. The, uh, you had your title company, but every piece of property west of the Mississippi was in our databases. So if your house was out in El Cajon, part of okay. San Diego, and you knew the address of your house, for example, I could call, or you could call for that better, and tell our, the title company in town, I would like to have a property profile. And this was something I invented for the title company out there. I invented it. Hey, Doc, hey, let me interrupt for one moment because they're about to close. Oh. Um, you, got your, you got your degree after you, you went back to school. Mm -hmm. You worked for Bill Bailey. Then you went back to school and worked for TRW. Yeah. And then after you got your degree, you got into business, you lived in California, and you retired uh, in San Diego. Mm -hmm. um, you had three daughters. Mm -hmm. uh, you originally got married in Hawaii mm -hmm. to Esther Ho. Yeah. And you had Ken Matson Jr. Jr. Yeah. And then y'all got divorced in 51. Yeah. And then you came back. Um, you did the inspector general stuff. You, you did all that. Got your degree. Went back to school. Had three girls. And then basically... You moved here when Jenna and I moved here mm -hmm. um, because we had grandkids. The mm -hmm. other two sisters yeah. didn't want to have kids. 1988. That's mm -hmm. right. And so then we've been here ever since. Mm -hmm. It just so happened that about six months ago or so, we found Ken Jr. We had not, we didn't know about Ken Jr. until we were going through some paperwork. And then we got, I found him in Colorado. Ken Jr. came back here. And they had a reunion about three months ago, mm -hmm. um, and he hadn't seen him since 19. What 19? When, when was the last time he saw him? He was 10 years old. 19. Yeah. Yeah. So Ken Jr. now lives in Colorado and is coming back to visit again. Um, but now, when you married Esther, you had to get the general to approve that. <coughs> yeah. Because uh, it was a mixed marriage. You couldn't marry yeah. somebody that was a different race. Yeah. So, uh, so the general had to approve that, correct? Yeah. So uh, we had General Moore was commanding general, and the deputy commanding general was a general named Bryce, and he was a southerner. And, of course, he was against mixed marriages. Okay. And so I had met Esther out there, beautiful lady, and... We were truly in love. This wasn't just a right. deal of my being overseas and lonesome or something. And so uh, uh, it wasn't a, a matter of whether she was uh, Hawaiian or Chinese or whatever. Right. But if you married somebody who was not pure white, you had to get permission from the commanding general or from a general. And so uh, I didn't think that was going to be any problem. So when we got, we made all the plans to get married and so on. And so it was a long form you had to fill out. It was a 8 by 13 page, both sides. So I filled out all the forms and so on. And then down here, it, where I signed it, and then it said approved, and place for the general to sign. And then it had to indicate rank and 
right. position. So, uh, uh, how many minutes would you say? Oh, there's no way of knowing. Okay. I could have made it out for General Moore to sign in the first place, but since General Bryce was the administrative guy, I mean, he was the deputy commanding general, and he and I were good buddies. He was a southerner like that, but he and I were good friends. I did a lot of good work for him, and he appreciated it like that. And so I was personally typing this form out and like that. And so I filled out the front side and filled out the back side. And so down at the bottom, I put W.O. Bryce, Brigadier General USMC, under the line where it said approved. So I signed this sucker, and normally I would have walked in and just said, I need your signature on this, General. But since it was just a routine matter, it didn't need to be signed today or tomorrow or next week because we weren't getting married for a while. And I could have just thrown it in his in basket. But uh, I took it in and told him, I said, this requires your signature. Uh, let me know when you sign it and I'll pick it up. So, uh, you know, he and I were close. I did lots of stuff for him, and he did a lot of stuff for me, and I and we worked together as a team. So I didn't expect any problems with it. But boy, that southerner in him—he was a southern gentleman, and that reared its ugly head. And he called me out in a few minutes, and he said, "I'm not signing this thing." He said, "If you want to marry one of these people from out here, that's up to you. But I'm not signing this sucker. If you want it approved, maybe General Moore will approve it, but I won't." So I said, thanks a lot, and took it back and walked around the corner and put it in General Moore's basket. And about five minutes, he came out of his office, walked out to my desk and said, here you are. And he had signed it approved. Good. And so then we went on and got married. Was there very much racism because you were married to a Hawaiian girl? Uh, not a great deal, but occasionally there was. But you didn't run into a problem in Hawaii, but when you came back to North oh, Carolina. Yeah. Uh, my first duty station back in, was in North Carolina. And of course, North Carolina is about as bad as you could right. find for something like that. And so I remember shortly after I'd gotten in town, I had a brand new car. And I went in, we were going into uh, like just Walmart or, or some store. Roses. Maybe a grocery store. And so I pulled in and, and, and it just so happened the cars came down in front of the store, and then the sidewalk turned a little bit, and there were several cars parked here. So I parked here. And so we went in the store. And so I, uh, when we finished, we came out and got in the car. I put her in the right seat, and I went on to get in this side. And about the time I was going to close the door, I noticed this guy standing there. He looked like he was 45, 50 years old man, and uh, so uh, it was an unusual place for him to be standing looking at me or looking at the car or mm -hmm. looking at her or whatever. And uh, so I said, can I help you or something like that? And he said, yeah, where did you get that Chinese thing? And I went over and took him by the front and said, if I weren't a gentleman, you'd be laying on the floor here. If I ever hear you make a comment about my wife again like that, I'll mop the floor with you. And it scared the living hell out of him because he knew I was telling him the truth. And uh, I got in the car and we left. We didn't have many things like that happen. Yeah. But if you were, like, just say in town here, and you walk down the street, you'd walk into the drugstore or walk into a place to get a chocolate soda or something. You'd see people's eyes going like this when you went by. Okay. We're, we're just about out of time. Yeah, uh, okay. Interesting story. I'm glad you were able to come in and, and tell us mm -hmm. uh, what it was like. And, and, uh, 
I want to thank you for participating, but also I want to thank you for your service. Uh, well, that's, you're welcome. I, uh, my pleasure, of course. Okay. Thank right. you.